You are listening to WMPG 90.9 Gorham Portland Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Ryan, DJ Star Watcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And you can head over to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, yeah, certainly. So this will be Friday, December 24th, the day before Christmas. Um, basically, we'll have a last quarter moon just after Christmas, so it's a waning gibbous moon. Um, it'll come up around 9.30 at night, and it'll set about 11 in the morning. So last quarter moon, of course, rises about midnight and sets about noontime. So the days are getting a little bit longer again. We had the solstice on the 21st at 11 in the morning. So now the sun rises at 7.12 and sets at 4.08. So they're still pretty short, but it's getting about a minute longer. And then, of course, we've got you three planets. Uh, Venus is getting pretty close to Saturn. It's about the same distance from Saturn as Saturn is from Jupiter. And pretty soon you will have Mercury join Venus just for a little while in the evening sky. So look for four planets in the evening sky. Then Mars has shown up again in the morning, but still kind of low, it'll be better uh, next year for Mars in the morning sky. So that's basically it for that. Um, now, this being a couple days, hopefully the web was launched on Wednesday the 22nd. That would have been at 7.20 a.m. So we didn't have the exact right time because they delayed it once last time we talked about it, it was the 18th. So now will be the 22nd. <laughs> So it's about two days later now. So it should be up there. It still has a lot of maneuvers to do. But mm-hmm. if it made into orbit, it started to some of the maneuvers. So we have a lot of new things to keep watching about the web. So that's about it. And the comet. Comet Leonard is getting brighter. A lot of my friends took pictures. I think it's just about naked eye visible or even brighter right now. So you can find that too. That's it. Ooh, exciting. Wait, yeah. where do you see Comet Leonard? It, it moves a couple degrees per day. I mean, I saw some good pictures. It'll be near the planet Venus. It was a morning object until recently, and I think it switched into an evening object, making it a little bit easier to see. It's really low on the horizon, and it might keep getting brighter, but I think after about another week, it'll get fainter again. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Bernie. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. So, like Bernie said, we just said goodbye to the shortest day of the year, not too many days ago, um, winter solstice, and today we are officially in the wonderful, beautiful, slushy, mushy season of winter in Maine. (laughs) Uh, We've already had a couple of snow days, um, nothing too major, but um, today's show is all about the science of snowflakes. So um, the last show that we did, Bernie, that was kind of focused on pure meteorological phenomena, I feel like, um, was when we did our show on lightning about, it was almost a year and a half ago, actually. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, with all the different types of lightning. I learned a lot, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so today's show will actually be all about the signs of snowflakes, Um, why they're formed, how they're formed, why no two snowflakes are ever alike. And um, just some kind of interesting snowflake facts that Bernie and I found particularly fascinating that we want to share with our listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> I just like blanked out for a second. Oh, okay. You're not getting old. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the one getting old. <laughs> um, okay, so as. Uh, we know that um, snowflakes, superior snowflakes, are actually found in the chilliest places. Um, wind and other conditions actually can kind of rough up snowflakes quite a bit. Um, but one of our very own um, American scientists, physicists, is uh, Kenneth Librecht. Librecht? Librecht? Librecht. Yeah, Librecht, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's a physicist at Caltech who is actually an astrophysicist at heart. Um, he's actually been a snow enthusiast for many, many, many years, probably a couple decades now. 
and um, he's done a lot of research and just kind of, you know, his work with snowflakes is is really purely scientific endeavor. There's really no benefit, I guess, um, is the way he describes it to how understanding how snowflakes form. But his insights do give us more information about the process of um, snow crystallization. So, Bernie, yeah. you have studied snowflakes informally yourself. Mm -hmm. um, could you give our listeners a little yeah. bit of a breakdown of how, how, why, and how snowflakes are formed? Okay, yeah, just a few more things about Kentu. He has written seven books on the subject, and he has over 10,000 images that he made and created from his work in his lab. And he was a consultant for the movie Frozen. So he had to make very realistic, on they are real snowflakes, but they didn't just find them out in nature. He can kind of recreate them. So he's a, a very good person to kind of go to as the expert. So yes, yeah, so I wrote a paper about this comparing, um, well, snowflakes in a snowball to a stone and a sea urchin and kind of juggling it to get a sense of the gravitational field of the earth, how the snowball would, would be melting and then the rate and all that. So what I discovered it was, even before we just watched what, what Ken was talking about, is the perfect example of six-fold indeterminacy. So it's basically a six-fold radial symmetry, and we can get into some of the details why a crystal grows. You know, any crystal, it could be quartz, doesn't have to be a snowflake, would grow that way for certain physical reasons. But the indeterminate part is kind of neat because it would never form exactly the same way, even though there's no DNA, there's no blueprint it'll form around. Uh, basically, a snowflake forms like a raindrop around a little bit of dust in the a in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and then be because it's super saturated, it'll get cold at certain temperatures and st and start forming. So to really see this, Ken redid all this in the lab, and then he got into a lot more details. So basically, um, there's many different types. Ken thought about 40 or 50 are enough. Some people had come <laughs> up with 108 different kinds <laughs> of structures for snowflakes, and Ken said, "Well, that's just too much. I mean, they're a little bit overlapped." <laughs> But even 48, I thought maybe this, there were five or six, even when I did my paper back in school a long time ago. I didn't know that there were that, that many. Um, okay, so you have plates, you have dendrites, you have needles, columns, which could be hollow or capped. You have solid prisms, thin plates, solid plates, um, sectured plates, dendrites, bullets, cups. I mean, you have so many other interesting shapes just based on the physics of how the molecules attract and then form that. And of course, this all basically can all be predicted, but um, just knowing the shapes based on, and that's based on temperature and humidity and airflow and all the different factors that Ken could control, but in nature, they just happen and we get all these different shapes and types. Right. I feel like that um, that is probably new and interesting for folks. Um, people mm -hmm. probably, we, we are very familiar with the six-sided branched flat snowflake. Yeah. Um, but in actuality, they they are all still hexagonal. Mm -hmm. um, they're all still six sided, mm -hmm. but they could be. It just depends on kind of which way they end up growing from that from that core hexagon that's being um, being right. created with that with that water vapor, right? And based on the temperature too. Actually, mm -hmm. Ken discovered some new things about temperatures. Why at a certain temperature? it'll grow more into a plate and why it'll grow more into a column. That really wasn't even known before Dr. Liebrecht actually figured that out and then you could prove it. So that's kind of neat too. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And do we do we understand why it's kind of a hexagon shape? Um, yeah, well, it's like a crystal. I mean, it's basically, um, you know, it's hydrogen and oxygen. It's water, water vapor. So hydrogen is a little bit positive, oxygen a little bit negative. Uh, there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. So they have to attract, and then there's some rough edges, and it'll be that six-sided shape, which is the most efficient shape in nature, you know, beehives and hexagons. And then as it roughs up, it can grow in that direction. If it's smooth, it can't grow in that direction. So it'll just form mm -hmm. itself like that. Again, the neat thing is it's without DNA or a blueprint, but it is obviously following some laws. It's not living per se, but it almost looks living when you can see that forming. So that's, what, that's how it has to form the six sides, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, mm -hmm. so like you were saying, uh, the plate like crystals will form when temperature and humidity levels allow most vapor to basically diffuse to the edges. So if you can imagine you're starting with a flat hexagon um, plate, if you will, 
uh, very, very small. Um, but you're starting with this hexagon base shape. And then if, if the temperature and humidity levels are correct, they could, the water vapors could diffuse to the edges and start growing outwards, which would be the, which would then create the snowflake that we're all used to. And then if, if they are kind of the right conditions for, for columns, they will then kind of grow up and up and below that um, that hexagonal plate that that we're starting with, and that's how you can get your column formation. Interesting. Um, another star player in the snowflake world mm -hmm. is from Japan, mm -hmm. Ukuchiro Nakaya, who. Um, he, he did an extensive systematic study in the 30s and 50s, um, 30s, 40s, 50s, to kind of just studying the different snow crystal types. I think he was probably one of those who, who had over 100 different yeah. types. <laughs> but he was also able to produce snowflakes in the labs by the time um, he hit the 1950s. And he used single rabbit hairs to actually suspend frost crystals in cold air through refrigeration. Ooh. And that encouraged growth into snowflakes. And he just changed the humidity and temperature, et cetera, to grow the plate and columnar shapes. And um, he had found, and I think this, this, um, this is corroborated by Ken, um, that at negative 2C and negative 15C, the kind of typical snowflake shape that we're all familiar with will form. And then columns will form at negative 5C and negative 30C. Mm -hmm. And then the impacts of humidity are that at low humidity, kind of there will be less branching for, for the star-shaped ones. And, um, and they kind of tend to re resemble more just like hexagons versus higher humidity they can become more intricate and um, much more branched as well um bernie could yeah. you give our listeners an overview of the history of kind of observations of snowflakes yes so they go much further back than you may think you don't need fancy microscopes or cameras and all that to first be interested in this so we both found a similar time for the first reference that in recorded history about 150 BC by the Chinese. So basically they um, compared a five-sided flower to a six-sided snowflake. So they mm. must have had some way before microscopes to see that it was even six-sided. I guess a big enough, nicely enough snowflake, you can see that without mm. all the details we went into. And then another one I found was about 1250 AD. So I, there were lots of other ones in between. So a, a Norwegian person named Olus Magnus, um, he actually published the first diagram of a snowflake. So obviously before cameras or uh, microscopes, but he could diagram them in some detail. And then this was interesting. So 1611, Johann Kepler, the same Kepler with the laws of planetary motion, um, he kind of figured out uh, why they were hexagons. And this is before we knew about oxygen and hydrogen molecules, because it's H2O that would form into a hexagon. Maybe if it was H4O, it would, it would be a different shape, maybe an <laughs> octagon or something. But when you were asking about the hexagon part, that's probably because of H2O. So before that level, he knew that they were hexagons. So that's kind of interesting. And then 1665, Robert Hooke, I think he's the one that invented the microscope. So a little bit after the telescope, he actually looked at one under a microscope and could see it a few hundred times bigger or whatever the power was. Maybe it wasn't a few hundred. And then, like you said, 30s and 40s was um, Nakaya. But oh, there was another person, Wilson Bentley. He was an American mm -hmm. meteorologist and photographer from 1865 to 1931. So in 1885, he wrote the first real book you know, beyond just some of the sketches and things. Um, it's called Snow Crystals. I actually have a copy of it someplace. It's still in print after all those years. He took over 5,000 pictures. So he got into real detail. He invented a, um, a method to put a snowflake on black velvet, mm -hmm. which obviously way before computers. So he could get a nice one and not just some crummy one that you walk out in the field and, you know, find one like Ken was talking about. So he, I don't think that's too different from how Ken takes his photos in the in the. No, but walk. he was remember he had a, a cardboard and he'd walk out and fluff. Yeah, he had like a piece of foam or something. He would keep brushing them aside, and literally one in a million was good enough to bring in and do something mm -hmm. with. Yeah. So then he didn't talk about the black velvet technique, but that was Wilson Bentley in 1885. So that's really the first modern, and then we have some other Japanese people, and then we have Ken Lee Brecht, and that's pretty much it for the history. <laughs> <laughs> a short version of the history. 
<laughs> I think um, some yeah. people have described uh, Dr. Liebrecht as as the Pope of Snowflake si science, <laughs> which I oh, found okay. very funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so one question for you, Bernie, mm -hmm. is so we've kind of described how they form and um, why they form um, some of the temperature and humidity aspects. Um, side note, I did also learn that if you, so, you know, you have temperature and you, you have pressure sometimes as well. Um, we don't obviously experience snowflakes or we don't see snowflakes who experience a lot of pressure differences, um, or f being formed under, uh, different pressures. But, um, I did learn that if you change pressure as one of the variables, that you can actually see other different shapes of snowflakes so not necessarily just hexagons but they could be like x shapes or or just more um, arms which is very interesting but anyways um why is it then that um both sides or all sides of the snowflake form pretty much the same like they all seem to be symmetrical oh yeah that's a good point. You can actually mention that because it's not like they're communicating with each other and they kind of know how it forms. It's just that they're meeting pretty much the same conditions and they would have to form that way. And again, it would be six sided based on the structure of H2O. So mm -hmm. it looks like it could be alive or living or have DNA and communicating and all these neat things, but it's just following the conditions and he could totally predict, you know, he could turn up this thing or that thing and make the crystal form in the, exactly the way and all six sides within that millimeter would do the same thing. I suppose if he had changed pressure on one side and the other, then he could make one side grow in a different way. So they, they do that because they're following whatever that fundamental law is beyond that, that whole applies for that. But every snowflake different when it's falling through the atmosphere because it's meeting slightly different conditions of mm. temperature, pressure, wind speed. Obviously, the pressure is higher right at the surface. That's how you get hail and thunderstorms. Uh, you get ice and it falls and if it's bigger it'll fall many times like five or ten times inside the thunderstorm it'll turn into golf ball or baseball <laughs> versus just a pea-sized piece of hail it may only form twice versus falling 20 times so you have all these other neat factors at work and that of course every little piece of hail will be a little different ken said actually any two of anything with any complexity will be a little different two yeah. trees two people two grains of sand so that i mean obviously you would expect that but they do form under the same, it's a positive feedback loop, the way they form, which is interesting too, because that's important in climate change and you know all kinds of other things, these feedback loops. And that's sure. what you're watching in real time with snow crystals. And you can relate that to other crystals like quartz and all kinds of neat salt crystals, so on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the forming of the columnar uh, crystals they kind of remind me you just as you were talking of yeah. the basalt columns that we see oh um, that's right right are those yeah on the, on the coast the main there that we talked about with yeah Johnson mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and there's a few places in the world I think France and some other places mm -hmm. where they have these really neat columns that are like huge not just little ones like we have they're mm -hmm. like a hundred feet high mm -hmm. that's right I'm sure it is the same structure because the rock after all basically it's just it forms the same crystals. There's not like they're growing in a cave, like, you know, with <laughs> something. But the cave being maybe the whole earth, and of course, rocks are lighter than iron, so they're not at the center of the earth, and all the other neat things you get in the different types of rocks. Yeah, that's the six sided crystal, exactly. So, um, one of the things I'm looking forward to, and mm -hmm. I hope that, um, you know, this is also studied as we venture outside of our our own planet mm -hmm. um but i did look into snowflakes on mars so we do know that it snows on mars and you do see those snow caps on on the planet um but what was very interesting is because mars doesn't have um an atmosphere like ours uh the snowflakes on mars are actually much smaller than here uh, they actually have roughly the same diameter as a human red blood cell um, mm -hmm. that was uh, reported by one study and uh, they were able to 
uh, by some of the orbiting spacecraft, they were able to calculate the size of those snowflakes on the red uh, planet, which are mostly carbon dioxide rather than water. And they kind of referred to them as, um, this is from MIT, uh, Dr. Carrie Cahoy, um, kind of referred to them as being fine particles and not flakes like they are here. Mm. And if if an astronaut were standing amongst snow uh, particles falling onto the Martian surface, they would probably see it more as fog because they're so small. Right. So I do wonder though, um, I don't know if anybody has actually sampled a snowflake there and seen what it looked like, but I, I am curious if, if it follows a similar pattern um, because if it's carbon dioxide, it might be different angles. So it might not be hexagon shape. I don't know. But oh, yeah, CO2 versus H2O. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you still get, yeah, but you get one and two. It might still be three, so it might still be six. Could that's be, the point. Yeah. It may not be hexagonal, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I did try to figure out, like, what what they m meant by, you know, it's funny because I'm, my background is material science engineering. We learned all about lattices, <laughs> but it's always kind of confusing how the math works out because hydrogen, um, dihydrogen oxide, so H2O, has an angle between the, the hydrogens as about 108 degrees. 108 degrees, yeah. 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 And, um, but the, the, the interior angle for hexagons is 120. Mm -hmm. So it isn't like the, the molecules are just kind of holding hands, but there's some kind of angle that is being formed between each hydrogen atom and each oxygen atom which is allowing it to form at 120 and these aren't like flat they're the the molecules are all kind of facing different directions throughout the lattice but um somehow that forms with their hydrogen bonding somehow it forms that shape <laughs> hmm. oh yeah and yeah but the neat thing about mars obviously yeah, they, they would be smaller, but we've actually watched ice melt on Mars. We had a mission called Phoenix that went near the Martian North Pole. Oh, nice. We watched it melt in real time. It was like on the surface and it melted. So I don't know what they studied, the crystal structure. Maybe that wasn't one of their objectives. Did it melt into vapor? Uh, yes. Yeah, sub, sub, okay. Yeah, okay. Right. So it okay. Was, it, was, it was too cold. It wasn't liquid yet. They didn't have a liquid pool of water left. It was vapor. <laughs> and then, of course, the South Pole on Mars is mostly carbon dioxide or dry ice. Mm -hmm. And the North Pole is mostly water ice. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we could study that in some more detail. But it makes yeah. sense it'd be smaller. And I don't know if it'd be six-sided or not. That, that's true because Mars is, is mo what little air they do have is mostly CO2 as it is to begin mm -hmm. with. There's no, almost no yeah. oxygen. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it's also really important. I know you mentioned this, but um, I just wanted to make this clear for our listeners that there's a difference between how snowflakes are formed and how we form ice like you know, putting water in the freezer and then forming ice. Um, snowflakes are are literally going from vapor to solid, whereas what we're doing is liquid to solid if by making ice cubes. And that's that's a really key difference as, as far as how these are. Um, oh yeah, good made. point. Like the super saturated water vapor is mm -hmm. a solid and not. Yeah, it's like super solid. cooling. Yeah. It's not like ice. Yeah, it's super cooling. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so one other question that yes. uh, came across was how large can snowflakes get? So mentioned that the, the, the snowflakes on Mars are much smaller, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, snowflakes, you have to imagine that they're, they're actually, um, as they grow, they gain mass and then they mm -hmm. fall. And so the larger they are, the faster they fall. And you know, they're kind of, there, there's a ton of wind and air resistance, etc. And as they fall faster, there are increasing forces on the crystal, which can cause them to break up. And so larger flakes also have a higher tendency to collide with other flakes. Um, so, you know, a lot of snowflakes actually may not make it. And, um, you know, ice crystals also just tend to fall out of their region where growth is most favorable pretty quickly and so they stop growing at some point just because of of that and um uh, i believe the largest pristine snowflake observed mm -hmm. has been on the order of one centimeter so oh. that's actually quite large mm -hmm. um that like you could actually see that 
-hmm. uh, and then the largest um, observed aggregates of snowflakes is on the order of five centimeters. So um, to give a, also, uh, because, because you were mentioning hail, um, the largest hailstone uh, was around a basketball size. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, you know, the, the clumps of them. But um, yeah, so largest snowflake um, on the order of one centimeter. I did not get how large your average snowflake is, though. Um, um, it's but it's about a, mil, a little bit over a millimeter, I think. Yeah, a little bit. Because they're as thin as a razor blade if they mm -hmm. grow that way out, you know, from the plate. So they can be really thin, but they, the average one was, I think, over a millimeter, one mm -hmm. or two millimeters. You could see mm -hmm. it, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So, Bernie, um, mm -hmm. as you were kind of researching this more, um, mm -hmm. was there anything that surprised you? Um, well, yeah, the, the, how many types and the details of how they grow and how they can be kind of controlled in a lab. Because I knew I actually have that book, the Snow Crystal book that Bentley published in 1885. I actually have that book and I knew about some of the Japanese people who were doing this work, but I hadn't heard the Ken Liebrecht until we just watched the Veritas interview. So yeah, there were a lot of details in there um, that surprised me about the different types and exactly how they form and why they form in different ways at different temperatures and all the inputs and all that. So yeah, we're always learning new things about that. Yeah. Why do you think we should care about snowflakes? Yeah. Well, I think we should. I mean, as even Ken Liebrecht said, uh, when he, cause he studies black holes and the rings of Saturn and stuff, and that may not be as useful, but we should care because they're very artistic and beautiful and they can inspire us and they're right here. We can do it ourselves. We can't walk through a, a black hole or walk up to the rings of Saturn. But so they're, they're I think, much more practical. And, be, and we can create them. We probably all made little cutout paper when we were in third grade or whatever <laughs> for snowflakes. And now with the Christmas season, that's perfect. But we should care. And even the, I guess, um, the indigenous, um, you know, people, they had different, uh, like 50 different terms for snow because basically the Inuits, I mean, they had all the different types of snow. So it means a lot more to them. And, and now we'll be able to appreciate snow better too. Not, you know, like we had some ice today and so on and we get big snowflakes. And just to be more aware of that and appreciate, you know, the beauty of them and so on. Sure. I did find it really funny that Ken, in one of his books, so he's, he has written lots of books. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of his recent papers, um, which is called A Quantitative Physical Model of the Snow Crystal Morphology. Uh, he basically describes in depth how water molecules and their movements at freezing are influenced under different conditions as they develop into the hexagonal crystals that we see. Um, and so he has put out a lot of manuscripts, a lot of novels, um, a lot of kind of popular science novels about snow and snowflakes. And um, he's often asked by his audience, like, you know, about this endeavor, what is the purpose of this? And um, one of uh, one of the quotes from his book is that I learned early on to always inform my audience that I have never spent any of their tax dollars on snowflakes. <laughs> and I just, um, I mean, I find that a little bit sad um, because what I love about this, what I love about Ken and all the folks that have come before him, is it is purely a kind of a scientific endeavor, just a pure like desire to learn about how and why um, things are and and if you see some of his images they're they're beautiful and you know so like you said it's 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 artistic and um, and we learn about how crystallization works mm -hmm. yeah I think it's more practical than black holes like we said mm -hmm. but yeah but yeah. he also was amazed at what, what he could learn and how he could get in control him and predict the future in a sense. Right. Right. And yeah, the tax dollars is interesting because maybe they should spend some tax dollars and we can put even more into it or other aspects, maybe even more the molecular or the quantum level of the snowflake. You know, where there's no, let, no limits to where we can go with the yeah, research. Sure. And then we could apply it in other ways beyond just art. You know, maybe we could make uh, maybe superconducting material that zero, zero Kelvin. I mean, all kinds of other things we could do. Electricity, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So for the sake of science, we hope it snows soon. <laughs> well, yes, I'm sure it will. <laughs> You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself and Bernie. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella. And from your favorite nerds, just a reminder to vaccinate 
to mitigate and then we can all congregate.